we're gonna start the show because today was like herding cats you take cats oh my to goodness a party cats to a party and this is what happens <laughs> Herding Don't cat. let the cats get into the finger painting. No. It's rule one. Rule number one. And we're starting in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 634, recorded on Wednesday, August 30th, 2017. Talk about guts. Hey everyone, I am Dr. Kiki and tonight on This Week in Science, we are going to fill your heads with more coffee, trigonometry, and whale teeth. But first. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Whenever natural disaster hits and we witness tragic loss of life and home and livelihood, I'm reminded that there is no such thing as a natural disaster, only man-made ones. The events, whether in Texas or India or elsewhere, while unprecedented in scale, were not unpredicted. That they were not prepared for is no act of nature, but our own damn fault. We have known for some time that with global warming would come, could come greater sea levels, larger storms, greater uh, per precipitation, and greater flooding. We have heard the dire predictions of scientists and we have seen many recent examples of those predictions proving true. What remains now is a choice to continue to ignore reality and endure devastation after devastation as a natural part of life, or take charge of our future, take charge of our leadership, take charge of our own protection. And in doing so, live in a world made stronger, safer, and more secure, a world built on the foundation of This Week in Science. Coming up next, The kind of mind I can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I wanna know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science Kiki. And good science to you too, Justin. And no, no Blair. No Blair today. Ah, Blair free. Yeah, but she's at an awesome science communication conference where she's going to learn all sorts of things, hone her ninja like communication skills to become Aww. even more of a science ninja than she currently is. That's right, she'll be back next week. But everyone else out there, welcome to This Week in Science. We're here once again to talk about all the science news that is fit to go in this show. And there's a lot. We have all sorts of fun science news. I have stories about old math, new hope, and moth love. What'd you bring, Justin? Uh, I've got a way to uh, prevent age-related uh, cognitive decline. I need that. Yeah, it uh, yeah. turns out there's an organ in your body that's already producing what you need. I got stuff on whale teeth, pleosaurs swimming, and uh, microbiota communication. Let me hear your biota talk, biota talk. <laughs> I love it. Get a little bit of Olivia Newton bacteria in there. Um, we are going to jump into all these things. But before we jump into our favorite segment, our new favorite segment of the show, I want to remind everyone out there that you can subscribe to the Twist Podcast on iTunes, in the Google Play Podcast Portal, on Stitcher, Spreaker, and TuneIn. You can also find us on YouTube and Facebook. You just search for This Week in Science and you'll find us. Or you can just visit twist.org. We now, are more places than I thought existed. <laughs> I know, so many. So many places. But you know what time it, it, it is now? You know what, what we're going to get into? Oh, yeah. It's the, it's the new 
Shtick, which is it new still because it's been going on for a while. I keep calling it new, but yeah, it's kind of like our no, junior high. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Adolescent shtick. This weekend, what has science done for me lately? <laughs> Hi, Kirsten, Blair, and Justin. My story goes twofold my work and learning English as my second language. Back in the fall of 2005, after our daughter Liza was born, my second cousin was about to fly from Canada to Ukraine to see a new member in the family. And he asked me what present I would want to, want to have. I was thinking about what I'll be doing during long walks with the baby carriage and iPod mini came to my mind. Ever since, I began listening to podcasts in English and Twiss was the first one. Yeah, I'm kind of a veteran listener. Mm. Yay! So kudos to Clever Engineers and iTunes platform builders for giving me a great way of listening to stuff that I, is deeply interesting in English and therefore helping me to polish my English more and more. Twist was only the beginning. Then I began listening to Wonderful Star Talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson, Life Scientific with Jim Ali Khalili, Orbital Path, and many others. All those podcasts helped me to grow my horizons and learn the language tremendously and continue to feed my curiosity daily. As to my work without science, not a chance that I would be able to work from home on a UK-based online publication as an editor and have a real freedom to work from wherever I want, having my laptop, Wi-Fi, and yes, coffee next to me. <laughs> if you think hard enough about what makes such work style and language learning possible, you'll name dozens and dozens of technologies that collectively made it possible. Without science, it would not be possible, period. Artyom Djokchev. Well, Artyom, thank you so much for listening to Twists. How awesome that we were your first podcast and you're still listening to us. That, uh, that makes, me, it makes, me, makes me blush a little bit. It's yeah. It gives me some and, goosebumps. And cool. I apologize if, if your English ends in ish a lot. <laughs> but that's, yeah. only find that here. And if you uh, verb adjectives or <laughs> yeah. verb nouns on a regular basis as a result of this show. <laughs> or if you noun verbs, I guess maybe that's what it is. Disclaimer I, instead of disclaim. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we noun the verbs. We verb the nouns. We take the language and we chop it into little pieces because science. And uh, I hope I hope we haven't sent you down It'll the wrong. You seem like path. a veteran of the language <laughs> by listening. Like, wow, Absolutely. they've altered the English in an intelligent yeah. way. That's right. what you English is all about, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for writing in with your story, Artyom. And I do hope that you and your daughter and your cousin and the rest of your family are doing very, very well. And maybe you've moved on from that iPod mini now. Remember, everyone, we need you to write in to let us know what science has done for you lately. What does it do for you every single day? I want to know. Our other listeners want to know. People want to know. So please share. Leave us a message on our Facebook page. Look for This Week in Science on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash This Week in Science if you want to go directly to it. We want to fill this segment with you and your stories. So please keep sending them in. I really enjoy reading them, and I love hearing about them. Thank you so much. Now it's time for the science. It is. Time to talk about old science. And in fact, mm -hmm. something that many people think of as the basis for science and scientific uh, discernment, discrimination, measurement, you know, of what I speak? Math. Mm. Maths. Oh, math. yeah. Math has always been important for that sort of thing. Yes. So if you think of math, who comes to mind? Who do we think of as being the first to start doing math and writing it down? Oh, uh, I, don't, I don't know that I can think of a, a first mathematician. Well, it's kind of put down to the, the ancient Greeks. Yeah, the, like the measuring, they had all sorts of math based on ropes, too. That was like how they were doing. They were really into geometry and the rest, but I don't know if they, I, I will go ahead and say they invented math. <laughs> we'll go right ahead. <laughs> go right ahead. I'm sure it was being used in some degree far before that, but yeah. So it's not 
the Greeks who started the whole thought process. We still use the Grecian system of math to describe triangles using angles that come from sticking a triangle in a circle, right? Because you can get the radians from inside a circle, what kind of angle comes from the edge of the circle. Anyway, figures out you can figure out the shape and you can use the angles for uh, describing triangles through trigonometry. And we have the, uh, the, the trigonometric functions of sine, cosine, and tangent, which any trigonometry student should be able to repeat the algebraic or the, the, tan, the geometric equations in their sleep if you plan on passing trigonometry this year. Welcome back to school, everyone. Anyway, we don't use the same system that the very first trigonometricians used because you know who it was? The ancient Babylonians. What? Yeah, this is a, such a cool story. So some uh, mathematicians from the University of New South Wales, they took a look at a really old cuneiform tablet that was written between 1822 to 1762 BC, BCE. And this was in the Babylon, from the Babylonian city of Larsa. They described all of this in a paper in Historica Mathematica, and they called the tablet a trigonometric table of a completely unfamiliar kind and ahead of its time by thousands of years. The interesting thing to it is that they didn't use the same mathematical system that we use or the ancient Greeks used. In fact, the numerical system of the ancient Babylonians was based on base 60 whereas we use base 10, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we use base 10. You can count it out easily, count things out and divide them easily You based on your fingers. But if you're going to divide something evenly in half from 10, you get uh, one half, which is, uh, you know, five, or you can do um, one fifth, which will be two. And those are the only even ratios that you get from dividing 10. The Babylonian system of base 60 has way more even ratios that can come out of it. And so they use that to actually uh, create this tablet that describes triangles. The, the tablet describes in trigonometric functions different sizes and shapes of triangles. And the angle is actually determined not from like the Greeks did, putting it inside of a circle, but from the relative lengths of the sides. And so they believe that the ancient Babylonians must, must have used these tables for describing uh, rectangles and triangles and using them for their buildings, their ancient construction, and for dividing up land and measuring, uh, measuring all sorts of things. And the researchers say that because of this unique base 60 calculation, uh, it actually could be superior in some ways to the trigonometry of today. In mm -hmm. some applications, it might actually be better than the way we do things. Yeah, it's, and when we say better too, it's just, I guess, I mean, you would end up with more whole numbers in places and yeah, then it, you would yeah. feel like it was neatly coming together in, in a better ratio. It's, you know, I, I've fallen off of the, uh, the lobbying for this a long time ago, but it sounds like a, a 60 system isn't far removed and could have a lot of the same characteristics as the dozenal system. Right. Which, was, I mean, which, which I used to talk about a lot. You could have a third would be four. It'd be a nice even number, you know, and you could take a third and cut a third in half and you'd have two. But but it would be a different two. <laughs> like it's it, it is a language. And so it does only have meaning as we assign it, assign to it. But the phenomenal thing about the language of mathematics is you could change that language completely in terms of what a what a 10 represents, what a, you know, what it, what's, what's a unit of 60 versus a unit of, of a hundred or you can change all of that and it'll still work. That's always what's fascinating. You know, the numbers you come out with will be in a different language. They will have, some will be whole numbers. Some will be point something, something, mm -hmm. 
Babylon, in, language, ba in Babylon, they didn't have decimals. Yeah, so they had to work their they way around decimals. it. Yeah. yeah, they had to work with bigger numbers to start with. Um, but ultimately, ultimately, you can you can come up with the same result with these different languages. Uh, yeah. What's in yeah, yeah, but what's interesting is that the Babylonian system, while it could have been and is possibly superior in some ways to the Grecian system, the Babylon Babylonian system died out. It just went away. And this is the first instance we have of, of talking about, about it and learning about it uh, and figuring out, okay, this is how they did trigonometry. They did trigonometry and now we know. Um, and the thing that we still have left over from the Babylonians is our clock. The 60 minutes in an hour, the 60 seconds in a minute, that is still based on the ancient Babylonian systems of counting. But that's the only thing that we have in our numerical system then. But boy, do we have that. But boy, howdy. <laughs> yeah, like we, <laughs> our life revolves in some way around that mathematical system. It does. Yeah, so moving on from ancient math, which is just so cool, this story. There's a, a, if you go over to Ars Technica, they've got a great write-up of this, and there's a video from the University of New South Wales where one of the researchers is describing it, and um, there, they, it shows you the, the table, and it describes the, the triangles and the way everything works together. It's a great video. Uh, I, if you have a chance, the link will be up on twist.org after I get a chance to put the show notes up tomorrow. Now, moving on from ancient variations in mathematical styles to variations in human epigenomes. We love talking about epigenetics on this show and how it could potentially influence human adaptation and evolution. And uh, we've talked about them for, we've been talking about epigenetics on the show for probably the entire history of the show, probably about oh, yeah. 15 Absolutely. years. <laughs> so yeah. this is an interesting study and I, I love having followed this stuff so long that we actually start seeing a study like this come into play in perspective. Some researchers published in a journal of Nature, Ecology and Evolution, their study looking into DNA methylation. So methylation is the adding of methyl groups to certain parts of the genome. And that methyl methylation is like a, it's like a little signal to either transcribe things from the genome or if it gets wrapped up in, if the DNA gets wrapped up in a histone, it's a signal, that stuff isn't going to get copied and we're not going to turn it into any proteins and it won't get expressed. So this methylation could be a very important aspect of uh, human ability to adapt to changing environmental conditions. So beyond just what's in the DNA, it's how does it get expressed? And that expressiveness is what can change our responsiveness. These researchers looked at various groups, very distinct groups of humans. They looked at five populations, six Siberian Yakuts, seven Cambodians, seven Pakistani Pathans, seven Algerian Mozabites, and seven Mexican Mayans. And the reason they chose these very distinct groups is that they thought that because they're very evolutionarily distinct, it would allow them to be able to not only differentiate just the, de the genome, but any uh, differences, very specific differences in the methylation between the groups. And the results actually are very fascinating. They found a strong link between population-specific methylation, so changes to where methylation occurred in the genome, mRNA levels or messenger RNA levels, that's the stuff that travels around and tells other things what to do, and the different genotypes. But these methylation sites where, the meth where this meth methylation occurred had the highest degree of population specificity and were more strongly associated with local variation in a single nucleotide pop uh, polymorphism than compared with the association of mRNA levels with these local changes in single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs or SNPs. And so what this means is that these 
little changes in the DNA, little single mutations, little flips in single base pairs of the DNA influence where methylation can take place. So it's not larger gene changes, but these little tiny switches that allow more or less methylation to occur. And so there's genetics that, that's population-based that kind of determines the responsiveness of population groups in terms of their epigenetic makeup. Mm. Yeah. So methylation is under genetic control, kind of, basically as to like whether or not the right, right amino acids are there to allow it to take place, whether the, uh, the right base pairs are there. Um, so so, the, so yeah. the, the genome has to sort of be open to interpretation. Yeah, like, exactly. Like it has to, it has, <laughs> uh, something has to then, well, and this is the tricky, this isn't want it to, you know, uh, it has to want to be changed or something has to have signaled that a change could be handy or uh, something has to signal that a change is possible. I mean, that gets into a tricky cascade of what's in, informing or triggering or is it, can it be, is it random? Mm -hmm. And if it's just random, how does it, get, then is natural selection come into place? Because it's, yeah. we've had this uh, conversation as, as an argument and as, um, <laughs> as an agreement that there does seem to be uh, a way for the ex memory of an existence over past generations to influence the future. Mm -hmm. right? we, we, we seem to be able as, as, as life forms on planet earth to evolve in a, in a beneficial direction when we need to. And that is largely a natural selection thing, but not entirely. So the question is then, when there is this opportunity in the genome to say, okay, allow a change to take place, is that selected based on an experience of the past? Or is that... Right. So in the past was, you know, some stressful conditions that maybe, the, uh, that maybe our ancestors went through in the Paleolithic era. Like a lot of getting chased by lions and not quite being fast enough to get away. Right. Or well, just the ones, barely being just fast barely. enough. Just barely. The ones that did get away. <laughs> like, it'd be nice to be this much faster. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one of the researchers notes that the consequences of this methylation aren't exactly clear. So now that they've kind of seen that there are differences between that are specific between population groups, uh, they still say it is likely that most of the variation we measured is not having any important impact. So the challenge is to figure out which genomic regions are important and how their DNA methylation impacts human traits. So it's like, okay, which genetic regions are subject to some change, but maybe not a lot of change, or maybe that need to be have differential expression like the uh, melanation, melanin, melanin, melanination, melanation of the skin, um, eye color, hair color, maybe uh, digestive ability. Um, how much acid does your stomach produce? How uh, how how easy how easily does your stomach work with all the bacteria that live within it? You know, how, there are all these different things that there are all sorts of little levers and dials that are at play. Epigenetics is one level of controls. And then the, the, the DNA is another, and yeah. And I suppose, I suppose to see a, a dramatic change, you'd have to have some, some perhaps deficiency where all those triggers are on and available to methylation, uh, available for the changes to take place. Yeah. You could sort of see then, you know, maybe, there's, maybe there could be a type of stress uh, from the environment that triggers that. And then what you would get isn't necessarily a specific direction driven uh, genetic change, but one that just says, hey, change needs to take place. Let's take all the barriers off of changing. And then that next generation may have slightly different features this way, that way, the other different interaction with the gut microbiota, sort of open it up 
for a wave of natural selection to pare it back down to what's working. So that's a, it's a, that's going to be a fascinating uh, uh, topic to, to look at again in the future. I, this is, yeah, this topic is going to be one that will come up again and again and again. Um, speaking of stress, my final intro story here, there were a few creatures, few, few little creatures that survived the KT boundary, the mass extinction that occurred as a result of the massive asteroid that struck the Earth and created the Yucatan Peninsula, shrouding our planet in darkness and cold mm. fires burned ah! yeah so not only was there physical stress on the planet which led to lots of volcanic stuff and lit lots of fires because of the debris falling everywhere there are fires that burned everywhere there was and then there's this the, all the stuff that ended up in the sky a lot of it fell back down pretty quickly like within a year or two they think but then there were the fires the fires that were burning probably put soot into the air that lasted much longer. And so a researcher from the National Center for Atmospheric Research used a climate model to look at the effect of soot, the soot that blanketed the planet after the wildfires kicked everything into the air. And the question is, was there enough soot? Would there have been enough soot to really darken the skies. I mean, what killed everything on the planet? Was it just the impact itself, the heat from the impact? Was it the darkening in the, of, of the skies and the, and the cold that came as a result? So anyway, he thought he'd figure it out. And um, the cool. estimates that have been made about of the amount of soot uh, that has been found in the rock layer of the total amount of soot that might have been in the air range from 750 billion kilos kilos to 35 trillion kilograms that's pretty wide yeah 750 billion to 35 trillion and that's not just wide but a lot and so they used those estimates and they ran a whole bunch of simulations through their climate model and they injected the soot high into the atmosphere and the soot would absorb and reflect the sun, uh, would absorb the sunlight and abs absorbing the sunlight, it would cause heat, heating of the air, kind of like, you know, black body radiation, you know, the heating of these things. The air would heat and the air would rise. And so the soot would end up higher. And so the simulations figured out that the soot would mostly end up going up and then falling back down again within about a year. But that's only part of it. There would still be enough soot in the air to block 99% of the sun's light. And if you saw, if you were anywhere close to totality or if you were able to see just a sliver of the sun. Could you imagine? I mean, the totality of the solar eclipse that just occurred in northern as North America brought brought 365 degree sunrise or sunset. You know, which is a very small of, amount of light. One percent of light ish for only two years. That's not a lot of sun, and that's that one percent of, of sunlight is where photosynthesis dies. If there's not more than 1% of, of light from the sun, photosynthesis stops. Hmm. We need 1% of the sun's light, of the sun's energy for plants, for things to get going, for photosynthesis to happen, for those algae, those little algae to grow. So two years without growth, and that's why they think the plankton species all died out at that point in time. And anything that relied on, the, on those plankton species would die out as a result of that. And 99%, if again, if you've ever seen a solar eclipse and been near totality, the, the temperature drops. If you lose that much energy from the sun, you lose several degrees. I, when I experienced the ex eclipse, it was probably 10 to 15 degrees that the, that the temperature seemed to drop. So 
Wow, that's pretty intense. Yeah. In the simulation that they did, the average ocean temperature would have dropped by about 20 degrees Fahrenheit, as much as 11 Whoa. degrees Celsius. Whoa. The land, the land temperature, the surface temperature would have dropped about 28 degrees Celsius or 50 oh. degrees Fahrenheit. Holy smokes. Yeah. yeah that, so that, I mean, wow. Just that would, yeah. Most of the planet, most of the planet's Not land survivors. would have been below freezing for a, for two years yeah. and most life forms just that alone could not have survived everything exactly. else being the same it, exactly and so there was you know part of the tropics that probably wasn't as cold where there was more heat energy from the sun you know they're getting the maximum amount of the sun 12 hours a day of that one percent of solar input this that probably might have been enough to keep this small area Mm -hmm. alive and then after about two years it would start to creep up again the soot is falling out of the air uh water paper wa um and then in the, as the the soot drops water vapor would have started rising into the sky the water vapor would have um gotten up there and then heated up and condensed as rain and so there would have been more soot falling out of the air and so eventually the natural cycle as things warmed up and as more and more soot fell out of the air it things would have cleaned themselves naturally but they estimate it took about seven years for the sunshine to come back for all of the sunlight from the sun to come back and in that time surface temperatures were low most everything died and it was only the few little things that could make do, that could creep past in the tropics that might have made it. Talk about a rough patch. <laughs> yeah, well, this Whew, is also the time when we had uh, <laughs> tropical poles, right? You know, we had, we, had, uh, we had alligators in Montana. We had swamps at the poles. Like, we, we, had, we had a very, uh, there was life everywhere on the planet when this took place. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, very dramatic uh, cutting back of, of life forms on this earth. Very oh, dramatic. I'm glad we made it. I was like, made for, it. for a minute in your story, I didn't know if we were going to make it. I was like, oh, what if, what if it's dark for a thousand years and it never goes? Ah, in a time. Time. It doesn't sound so bad. It sounds like sun. <laughs> The atmosphere yeah. never recovered. Life on Earth ended. Oh, yeah, so it's a it's a fascinating it's a fascinating idea, and um, yeah, the idea of whether or not there were uh, plants that whiskey renegade bringing up the idea of plants dropping seeds. Uh, maybe there maybe there were seed stores. Maybe there were things that after about two years could have brought things back. But um, well, you know, one of the yeah, and and that, the, one of the benefits of of, of a frozen uh, uh, landscape is that it can also be preservative in some ways if if the planet comes back, which which it sounds like it did. It sounds like it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. it sounds like a podcast. Sounds like, it. and it also <laughs> makes it, and it also it just quickly just makes me think of you know when we look at the archaeological records, what we're finding usually is stuff that got encased in mud. That sort of thing. We're we're scurrying about trying to get these these uh, these mammoth mammoths out of thawing uh, permafrost right now. Which, if we weren't here now, getting them out of the permafrost, we would never be able to find them. Um, likely. Uh, so so all these there's so many species perhaps uh, on this planet that we don't know existed just because they were frozen over quickly and then re-exposed to elements. And you know, disintegrate into and into an unrecoverable state. So, it'd be interesting to to in the future see if there's ever going to be a way to sort of recalculate or or or, or discover, as we've been finding. You know, when we can go into a cave now and we can get we can get genetics from the soil to tell us about uh, what may have been there. Uh, hopefully, there's some areas left on this planet that we can we can discover that. That we can we can maybe look for these missing species. Absolutely, keep looking, keep looking, and you no, know, there's hope. You know, if 
Yeah, our, our sky ends up darkened for any reason. I don't know. Maybe we need to pollute more. Maybe that's what the message is. No, no. I don't think that's what it meant at pollute all. Pollute more. What are you talking put about? Put into the air. Uh, and I, then found a new, the I, I threw a new cool. story. Okay, you've got stuff. This is This Week in Science, you guys. I a new story in here just to follow up. So uh, back in 2013, a, a house-sized meteorite uh, struck a Russian city. It was, it was, it was big enough in fact it got caught if you remember this one this was in where is it uh chelyabinsk binsk chelyabinsk chelyabinsk um it shattered windows thousands of people had injuries from flying debris people were knocked off their feet by the impact it was caught on dash cam in a car it was like we had we could see it streak across the sky we had video of this one yeah, thank goodness all the Russians have issues with um, mob and police brutality. Yeah, stuff. No, no have, it's not that. Dash cams. Well, it's that, and they have an odd. It's like it's mandatory now because of insurance. The way the insurance, insurance companies, right. okay, and because Russian tires are <laughs> terrible. Uh, everybody blames their tires. <laughs> no, um, so this was yeah, this was a pretty big one, uh, about ten kilometers. Or no, excuse me, 10 kilometers. Uh, it was 17 meters in diameter. It was about the size of a six-story building. It's pretty big. Uh, yeah. And it, it, was, it was pretty huge. So now the, the one we've been just talking about was 10 kilometers. That's the one that caused the mass extinction event. So yeah. much, much smaller, almost a magnitude smaller, right? Yeah. But the question is, how many of these things are out there? And there's a survey uh, looking for near-Earth objects. Uh, and what they, I guess, said is that about there's 3.5 million near Earth objects that are larger than 10 meters. So, in the size of about the size of this six story building impact in Chelyabinsk and, or bigger, 3.5 million of them. The good news, if, if this is good news, about 90% of those near Earth objects are about the size of the one that hit Russia, 10 to 20 meters. So, so while, <laughs> what, and this is good news because this is good news because as, as, as awful as that was, and it could have been worse, um, it does mean that there's not, that, you know, there's not a lot of those, those sky darkening uh, bodies out there. Right. So, yeah, it, the, the, the probability of being struck by something that is so massively destructive is about, you know, nine to one, ten to one. Right. And, and, and what it is, too, is it's also this study has also lowered uh, significantly the idea that we could be hit with a devastating impact the, before the observation, the the potentials or the estimates were much higher, that there would be much larger objects out there. So all in all, you know, 3.5 billion sounds scary, but all in all, it's actually downgrading the threat that existed previously due to estimates. So that's a good thing. Uh, this, is a, this is an amazing state. This is age-related memory loss, maybe reversed by boosting the effects of one of your organs, Kiki, which organ do you think it might be? Um, I don't know. <laughs> My spleen. Ah, your spleen. <laughs> Very good guess. My uh, spleen. Spleen. But uh, no, your bones. Oh, my bones. Yeah. Okay. Boosting blood levels of osteocalcin, hormone produced by bone cells. Uh, this is according to mouse studies led by Columbia University Medical Center researchers. They also identified a receptor for osteocalcin in the brain, paving the way for a novel approach for treating age-related cognitive decline. And this is something that we have seen the anecdotal, not anecdotal, the correlative, I guess, uh, studies where they would do these mouse blood transfusions. You would take young mouse blood and you would put it into the system of an old mouse and you would find that their cognitive abilities improved. And we've been looking at, is it junk, deteriorative junk that's in the older blood? What is the thing? Why is it that 
young mouse blood transfused into older mice makes them cognitively seem younger. And in some cases, physically seem younger too. And we were also pondering how the future of, you know, humans, wealthy humans using the blood of the young to live longer. It seems right. this sort of vampiric future. I, I do still love the, uh, yeah, the fantasy aspect of that. But yes, go on. Yes. Uh, so Let's go back so, to the science away from the fantasy. The, okay. Uh, so yeah, so they, they'd seen those improvements with the with the plasma. Uh, so now they've re the researchers determined that osteocalcin binds to a receptor called GPR-158. That is abundant in neurons in region of the hippocampus, which is part of the brain's memory system. All right? This is confirmed by inactivating hippocampal GPR in mice and subsequently giving them the infusions of osteocalcin, which did not improve them their performance on memory tests but adding it did. So uh, they also didn't find any toxic effects in the mice. Of course, this is on mice and not humans. So they've still got more work to do. But uh, hey, yeah, if, if age-related cognitive decline is one of those things that you're worried about, meaning you're over 40. <laughs> so I wonder, you know, we have issues, especially in women with osteoporosis and deterioration of the bone. And we don't really think of uh, the bone. I mean, we think of the bone as this structural component. We don't think of it as the organ that it is providing us with new blood cells and providing us with hormones and uh, all sorts of compounds that, I mean, it's it is a living organ that is highly uh, important in the endocrine system. This is an endocrine organ. Um, and so I, it just, this finding really makes me wonder, you know, we, we have deterioration of the bone and the bone itself not upkeeping in osteoporosis. Um, what does that mean for the health of the bone as an endocrine right. input? If it's not yeah. keeping itself up and if it's not doing that, then it's probably not providing all the things like red blood cells to carry oxygen, like this uh, osteocalcin. Yeah, you and know, in one experiment, aged mice were given continuous infusions of osteocalcin over a two-month period. The infusions greatly improved animals' performance on two different memory tests reaching levels seen previously only in young mice. And I don't, and, and if you bring up an interesting question, but I don't know. I mean, we don't, uh, I, I, it might not affect it at all. It may be because of course the, the bones aren't just worried about the structure of the bone itself. They're an organ that is, is introducing red and white blood cells to your body and, and having this effect also on memory. Maybe, maybe there's a, maybe there's a, a a trade-off that it's making to keep the blood healthy uh, versus worrying about its own structure that's taking place in osteoporosis. Maybe, maybe it's not deteriorating. Uh, mm -hmm. um, right. Maybe but, it is. Maybe it, maybe there is a trade-off. Maybe it's to keep the body healthy. It's deteriorating structurally. Yeah. Maybe there is. Yeah. Who knows? Organ. That's an interesting question. Yeah. But it does. That does really make me think about bone health as you age. People break bones all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do we keep our bones healthy? I know it's not drinking a glass of milk a day. <laughs> <laughs> I know. No. Uh, more news having to do with bones. Australian scientists have made an ancient whale discovery. Uh, today's world, there are baleen whales, like the blue whale, which filter plankton from small fish in the ocean for food. They use bristle-like structures where their teeth uh, might have been. Uh, and then you have the killer whale, which has got teeth and chomps down on larger prey things to eat them. Uh, now we're finding out that the ancient whales had extremely sharp predator teeth similar to lions. The discovery was published Wednesday in the journal Biology Letters shows that whales at some point completely changed their teeth as well as their prey and their feeding activities, which I guess is something that we knew, but this is showing that the ancient baleen whales, uh, based on their 3D scanners at the museum, had these had these sharper teeth. Uh, let's see, ancient whales had extremely sharp teeth, similar to the lions, but they uh, 
the, I guess the argument has been, how did this change take place? When did this change take place? And according to this, contrary to what many people thought, whales never used their teeth as a sieve. So the idea was they started using their sharp teeth as the filters and stopped going after the prey. And, but this is saying, no, those, those teeth had one function. Those teeth were to <laughs> chomp, just to chomp down and cleave <laughs> flesh from things that they were eating. That's according to the Museum of Victoria's Senior Curator of Rutabert Paleontology, Eric Fitzgerald. Uh, so, yeah. So, this is instead, they think um, maybe this is a, a, a filter feeding technique showed up after their teeth had already been lost. So, mammals eventually lose their teeth, right? Teeth start falling out. If, you, if you're a really successful predator and you've lived a long time and you're big like a whale and you're, you don't have other predators, but you lose your teeth, maybe you do have to come up with something else. So it's just sort of an interesting thing that it wasn't this gradual transition maybe between these sharp teeth and the baleen, but that something else may be sort of in the middle of that transition Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, that we maybe we haven't seen that yet, but there's something else that yeah. happened. And I mean, and it, it also brings up like that that idea of going from a predator to a filter feeder, and that and that. I mean, it doesn't just change what your teeth are like. You know, first you also got a whole lot of activity differences. The way you pursue prey is completely different. The way you expend energy is completely different. The way you metabolize those small foods or those large things is going to be different. Your micro, the, the whale microbiota had to change uh, mm -hmm. to take care of this effect. So, so a lot more needs to be learned. And that uh, also something we didn't know. How's a pleosaurus swim? Um, with <laughs> its swimmy bits. Yeah, it's swimmy bits. It had four flippers. <laughs> uh, and a huge body and a long neck and seemed kind of awkward. And it's one of those sort of like physicists can't prove that a bumblebee can fly. It's too large for its wings, which and that was something somebody said that was maybe never actually true. But there has been a mystery about how this, this creature swam. There's no other example of anything that used four flippers simultaneously while swimming. And it's a really big creature. so. It didn't seem like it would be very effective. Uh, so the uh, researchers recreated pleosaur flippers using three, a 3D printer. They then studied pleosaur fossil specimens, photographs of skeletal configurations before attaching the printed flippers to a body fabricated to mimic the pleosaur's form. Next, they studied the way modern creatures, such as turtles, use flippers to get around and adjusted the fake flippers to allow them to move in similar ways. They placed the faux pleosaurus into a tank of water, added dye to see water movement, and began repeatedly adjusting the flippers until they came up with a configuration that resulted in optimal propulsion. Team reports. And, and, and? <laughs> it swam best when all four flippers were used for swimming uh, simultaneously. Additionally, they know they had been, well, not quite simultaneously. They had, no, they had, had to be in a specific way. As the front flippers flapped, they created a vortex of water under the body. Back flippers would then flap between the whirlpools, which better used the energy expended. In essence, the team notes, the creature made use of its own wake. The only other creature besides the dragonfly, interestingly, found to do so. More testing showed that when flippers worked well together, the back flippers were able to increase thrust back to 60% by flapping without assistance from the, from the front flippers. Hmm. So kind of a get going and then just the back ones take over for a while. Hmm. Yeah, you could. I mean, you could coast and use some flippers and not the others, but yeah. And this is the, this is the idea it, of figuring out the hydrodynamics of how this all worked. <laughs> let's print flippers. Let's, let's, let's just pretend. Let's make it, let's see what we can put together and see how it works. Yeah, so this is, and this is, uh, for if you can't picture one, this is sort of, if you if you can't picture what a pleosaur looks like, uh, but I've seen pictures of uh, what's reported to be the Loch Ness Monster, it would be kind of like that. Oh, there we go. Look at that. We got visuals up for those who are visually 
prepared. Absolutely. And uh, in other news, another uh, researcher found a another um, a new pleosaur specimen, a new species of pleosaur that had uh, had, a, had a lot of bones in its neck. Mm -hmm. A lot more bones in its neck than um, many other dinosaur species. And this is a story I was going to save for the very end, but I thought that you might find it interesting based on this pleosaur study. Um, this pleosaur that was found was, um, oh, there we go, if I can find the story. This pleosaur, this published in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, it's called Lagenanectes ricteri, And it does, as you said, kind of look like the Loch Ness Monster. And the reason I didn't say the number is because I thought I had to double check it because it, I was like, wow, that's a lot of vertebrae. That's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of neck vertebrae. And it really is 75 vertebrae in its neck. Holy smokes. This is the longest necks of any prehistoric marine reptile. Wow. Yeah. 75 vertebrae in this pleosaur. Um, the researcher who made the pleosaur finding, while he was doing his work on this pleosaur thing, he was wandering through a museum and at the Lower Saxony State Museum in Hanover, paleontologist Sven Sachs. He, uh, he checked out a specimen that kind of caught his eye that was up in a display and it was mistaken. It was a, it was a dinosaur and he was like, wait a minute. I just last year found this new ichthyosaurus specimen and that looks a lot like an ichthyosaurus. So can we take that down off the display and I want to check that out. <laughs> and yes, indeed it had been misidentified and the museum had put another species tail on it just to kind of make it look displayish. Oh, that's <laughs> criminal. Yeah, I guess this happens fairly often when they just want to put well, so, a complete so, specimen up somewhere. And so they took, and so it had, was nobody had noticed really. And this guy's like, okay, wrong tail. What is it? It's an ichthyosaurus. And so this dusty display fossil sitting there turns out to be an ichthyosaurus. And it's a brand new specimen, a new species that hadn't been described before called Ichthyosaurus somersetensis, and it's a very large specimen of its kind. They think it was probably about uh, uh, 10 feet long, and it had a little seven centimeter long embryo inside of it that pregnant. was also, in, it was a pregnant ichthyosaur fossil. Wow. Yeah. So they, yeah. Those dusty old shelves of misnamed dinosaurs at natural history museums, full of gems. Yeah, and there is a thing. I mean, uh, those displays, typically they're not paying a scientist to put them together when they want to put up a new exhibit. A lot of museums will, will have an in-house crew that's job it is to put stuff together for the display. And so you don't get, uh, you don't get that level of double checking necessarily on the, uh, I mean, it should have arrived there together. This is certified. This is all one specimen. Um, but yeah, somebody might have used a little artistic license on the tail there. A little artistic license. That's right. A little not artistic not a license kept a di Well, and it's not hard to understand that the species wasn't really identified until recently because I mean, they really only started identifying and characterizing these ich ichthyosaurs, this particular lineage, fairly recently. So, Yeah. But anyway, misidentification. A case of the misidentified ichthyosaur. And on the other hand, great job of uh, putting it out there to display for some scientists to catch. Otherwise, they might not have uh, got it. Might be That's still right. sitting in a box. Mm. That's right. Hey, do you want to take a break right now? Yes. Yes, <laughs> I, don't say that I bet you do. I'm going to stay here and keep talking. You go take a break. Okay. <laughs> All right, everybody. This is This Week in Science, and Justin will be back in just a few moments. Stay tuned. <laughs> More than 
Hey everyone, thank you so much for being here for the first half of This Week in Science. The second half is still coming up, but I have a few things to say in the meantime. For those of you who are interested in supporting twists in various ways, shapes, and forms, here's the information that you need to know. If you head on over to twist.org, twist.org is the place where you can find all sorts of information about this week in science, you can find current show notes for every episode. You can find the most recent episode. You can also find links to ways that you can help us out. So if you head over to twist.org, you'll notice that you can click in the main header bar on a little link called Zazzle Store. Hit that Zazzle Store button and it opens up our Zazzle Store. This is the place where we have our logo emblazoned all over all sorts of items that you might discover that you will enjoy using and having around, wearing a t-shirt that says twists on it, wearing a hat, having a tote bag, or maybe even having a mouse pad with a T-Rex on it that Blair drew. That's right. Many of these items are also Blair's Animal Corner artwork from her original Blair's Animal Corner This Week in Science calendars of the last couple of years. So head on over to twist.org, click on that Zazzle store link and Start perusing, start shopping. Do you have a twist lover in your life who you'd like to buy a present for? Maybe check out this website. Right now it looks as though there is a discount deal going on, 15% off with code ZAZPARTYSALE. Head on over there. ASAP, don't miss out, yo. Um, if you are not interested in things, but rather ongoing support of This Week in Science, if you scroll down the right sidebar, there's a donate button. Click on that. It will take you through to a PayPal interface where you can insert your PayPal information uh, or credit card information to be able to donate to This Week in Science. One time, as much as you want. It's pretty easy to do. If you want to support us in an ongoing fashion, then you can click on the Patreon link that's in the header bar. Click on that Patreon link. It'll take you to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash This Week in Science. Patreon.com is a crowdfunding source, a crowd, crowdfunding website that uh, is that we use because we found it wonderful for building our community and allowing new ways to interact with you you who watch and listen to our show. Um, and so you can click on the red button, become a patron at the level of your choice. You determine how much, how often you're willing to give to support us, um, whether it's once a week, once a month, um, or multiple times a month per episode. And it's up to you, but your support is really what keeps this show going and keeps us going on and on and on and on and on and on. I mean, yeah, I'll stop now. Okay, on and on till the break of dawn. If you head back over to This Week in Science, you may also see that there are things like our RSS feed where you can send that link to be able to help people subscribe to Twist. There's a subscribe button that has links to our iTunes. Uh, so you can help share our iTunes link with people. Uh, you can share twist.org with people on Twitter, on Facebook, on Snapchat. Why don't you share Twist on Snapchat? Do you Snapchat? Instagram? Send some pictures of yourself watching twists. I would love to see those. Hashtag twists. You know it. Whatever way you are able to help and give to twists, you keep this show going. You are the people who are really behind this show. Thank you for all your support. We really could not do this without you. Sinister food, your dinner tastes awful, so it's gotta be good. But still, you can't believe what a skeptic I yeah. I can't believe you believe in that shell. We disagree, but I still give a damn. And we're back with more this week in science. Yes, we are. Justin, what you got? Uh, what did I bring? What did I bring? Oh, yeah, this story. Okay. Uh, if you've listened to this show for pretty much any length of time, at least recently, <laughs> you are uh, well aware that you are what your microbes eat. 
and sometimes what they want you to eat. And and you a lot of a lot of human behavior may be even driven by our symbiotic relationship with the trillions of bacteria that live within our bodies. And when they talk, we listen. New research from Rockefeller University and the Eichen School of Medicine at Mount Sinai suggests this communication may be the door to engineered gut flora that can have therapeutical beneficial effects on disease. We call it mimicry, says Sean Brad, Brad, or Brady, director of Rockefeller University's Laboratory for Genetically Encoded Small Molecules, where this research was conducted. The breakthrough is also described in a paper published this week in the journal Nature. Brady and co-investigator Lewis Cohen found that gut bacteria in human cells speak what is basically the same chemical language based on molecules called ligands. Ligands? Ligands. Building ligands. on that... They developed a method to genetically engineer the bacteria to produce molecules that have the potential to treat certain disorders by altering the human metabolism. In a test of their system on mice, they introduced a modified gut bacteria, which led to reduced blood glucose levels and other metabolic changes in the animals. So they're calling it mim mimicry because they're impersonating uh, the effects of of natural microflora in the gut. Method involves the lock and key relationships of ligands, which bind to receptors on membranes of human cells to produce specific biological effects. In this case, the bacteria-derived molecules are mimicking human ligands that bind to a class of receptors known as GPCRs, or G-protein coupled receptors. Many of the G-protein coupled receptors have been implicated in previously in metabolic diseases, Brady says, and and are the most common targets for synthetic drugs, drug therapies. They are conveniently present in the gastrointestinal tract where the gut back, uh, bacteria also are found. If you're going to talk to bacteria, says Brady, you're going to talk to them right there. That's, the, that's where you got to get your mouth right up to if you want them to hear what you're saying, right there in the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, in, in their work, Cohen and Brady engineered gut bacteria to produce specific ligands uh, that bind with specific human receptors. And it's known to be involved in the re uh, regulation of glucose and appetite. There has been previously uh, has previously been therapeutic target the treatment of diabetes and obesity with the drugs. The bacterial ligands they created turned out to be almost identical structurally to the human ligands. So they worked. Among the advantages of working with bacteria, Cohen says, who spent five years at Brady's lab as part of the Rockefeller Clinical Schools program, is that their genes are easier to manipulate than human genes. And much is already known about them. All the genes for the bacteria inside of us have been sequenced at some point, he says. In the past, researchers in the lab have mined microbes from soil in search of naturally occurring therapeutic agents. In this instance, he started with human stool samples in his hunt for the gut bacteria, which, with that, which uh, had the DNA that could be injured, so, uh, engineered. So, so they 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 were trying to find, you know, uh, that that thing outside and the na naturally occurring in the world that they could use, and then they went, well, wait, let's just look for it where it's already we know it's already naturally occurring. When he found them, he cloned them and packaged them inside E. coli bacteria because of the ease of growth. And he could see what the molecules that uh, the molecules engineered. Wait, he could then see what molecules the engineered E. coli strains were making. So they were also easy to identify what those genes produced once the E. coli were producing. Although they are a product of non-human micro, uh, microorganisms, Brady says it's Mistake to think the bacterial ligands they created in the lab is foreign. The biggest change in thought in this field over the last 20 years is that our relationship with these bacteria is not antagonistic. They are part of our physiology. What we're doing is tapping into the native system and manipulating it to our advantage. Right. Commensal bacteria. Mm -hmm. These bacteria that are that live in our guts, let's start using them 
yeah. to our benefit. Yeah. And so they're not really going to be close. This isn't, this is like maybe someday, right? Someday this could be a drug tar drug target. Someday this could create something. We could create these things, but at the moment, it's just starting to learn about it, right? Right. And, and it, I think the important lesson from this, too, and understanding what the cutting edge in going in that direction is, is whenever you see something that's called a probiotic, to understand <laughs> that at the cutting edge of science, they're just beginning to unlock the thing that may lead, lead to the thing that becomes the thing that that's, creates a beneficial microbiota. Like, like we're... We're really in that stage. Just because the news that we now understand that this exists exists doesn't mean probiotics that are going to be beneficial for specific things exist. Right. We right. know that we know that there's a there there. And yes, you can you can you can shoot arrows into the darkness and occasionally hit the target. But uh, where we are now is figuring out where the targets even are, how to shoot the bow, all of that stuff, right? Like to take my analogy too far. <laughs> yeah, but what I think what I think is so interesting here, I mean, what we're talking about, these are commensal bacteria. These are bacteria that live with us. They maybe don't have any effect, maybe have positive effects on our physiology, you know, may or may not be beneficial. They're part of our system though. And what they've done, these are little tiny organisms that learned somehow along the way to create the same molecules that our body cells use to communicate so they could talk to the cells and say, don't get rid of me. You yeah. like me. <laughs> I want to stay here. You know, <laughs> It's like these molecules allow these bacteria to stay there in that environment more easily because without that communication, our gut cells would probably be more likely to put up a fight. Yeah. And, and smart little bacteria. This probably happened a long time ago, bacteria. too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's one way. The other way is they engineered the ship. <laughs> <It's>, yeah. <laughs> that the whole body was built around preserving the crew. There you go. Yeah. Crew, right? So, there is that. that is an, uh, that's another alternative explanation. <laughs> what fun, though. Mm -hmm. I love the. I love the body talk of the gut, the bacteria, where we're gonna, what we're going to learn about all this is fantastic. But you know what I want to talk about right now? How moths talk to each other. Hmm? It's, it's I through chemicals. It's through chemicals, just like those bacteria. It's chemicals, moths, you know, with the wings and the dark and they're attracted to the light. Not colorful and pretty usually, at least as colorful and pretty as butterflies. Nice cousins to the butterflies, right? Mm -hmm. When it's mating time for the moth, pheromones come into play. Mm -hmm. And moths release a lot of pheromones, especially the female moths, which the males use to find the females, to hunt down the females through the air, through the plumes of pheromonal scent until they find the female of their choice and they're able to mate and thus the species is propagated. But since there is the pheromone in question, researchers have determined that there are sexy female moths and eh, not so sexy female moths. There are the female moths every single time they are around, they attract a male doesn't matter. The males come to the sexy scent of that female. There are other female moths who just, they're there, and the males never come. So if the males never come to the not-so-sexy females, how do they continue to perpetuate their makeup of the species, right? Why are there not-so-sexy moths? I'm going to guess lipstick. <laughs> nope. Wait, you know what it I is? Have lips? No. No. Do. no, no lips. No lips. But you know what? It's all about having friends. Oh. It's all about having friends. That right. Research by Astrid Groot from the University of Amsterdam 
looked into a species of tobacco budworm moth, Heliothis virescens, and it's a caterpillar, a pest species. We don't really like it in the United States. Farmers often use pheromone, pheromone scented traps to actually trap them because it's an easy way to for animal control, for insect control for this particular species. Um, and so she, she had noticed that some females never attract males, and so she wanted to test for this. And so she bred the most and least attractive. She basically tested these female moths. She'd take a moth and say, how attractive are you to males? She took the most attractive females and bred them to create super sexy females. She took the least attractive females and bred them to make super not sexy females. And then she paired them off in different combinations. So she had pairs of attractive females and one of the two of the attractive females always got a mate. When two unattractive females were together, they never got mates. Oh no. Ever. <laughs> but when she paired an attractive moth with an unattractive moth, the unattractive moth mated 17% of the time. Which isn't the best, but it's good odds. I don't, well, I, you know, I don't know what the other... The, and, the, and the odds are that, yes, the attractive one gets the bulk of the matings, but just because the unattractive one is in the vicinity of the attractive one, she sometimes gets a mating because when the male moths get kind of close in, they use the pheromone scent to right. get there, they're, but they're then once they're at close the bar in, at one o'clock in the morning. Yeah, they're not really <laughs> paying attention. <laughs> so that's just what happened every once in a while. So they think that these females, these unattractive females, might be perpetuating through the population because of their attractive pals. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it comes down to mating probabilities. So when the females are, and when the females, the attractive females, why would the attractive females ever hang out with unattractive females? Well, when they hang out with other attractive females, it lowers they, their chances. It lowers their chances of mating. Yeah. They have a 50 50 chance of mating as opposed to an 83% chance of mating. So, yes. It's better for both the attractive and unattractive female to be friends in this tobacco moth situation. Yes. Yes, and Shinago says, yep, moth wingman. Yeah. This is the case. Wing ladies. Moth wing moth ladies. Ladies, if you're a moth. <laughs> I'm getting a little tired. Maybe I could use some coffee. Oh, yeah, you should drink some coffee. Uh, <laughs> Recently reported an observational study, nearly 20,000 participants suggest that coffee can be part of a healthy diet in healthy people. Coffee is one of the most widely consumed beverages around the world, says Dr. Adela Navarro, cardiologist at Hospital de Navarra, Pamplona, Spain. Previous studies have suggested that drinking coffee might be inversely associated with all-cause mortality, which I think we have reported on this show before. But this has not been investigated in a Mediterranean country, she says. So they did the study there. <laughs> and, and in a way, this is a good, this is a, like trying to see if the same sort of study works somewhere else. Because as we bring our attention to every once in a while, most of the studies that we report on are reported on here in the Western world. And then you've got the conflagration of, is it Western medicine? Is it Western diet? Is it Western this? Is it Western that? Is it the pool of the people who are part of the study? So yes, the, uh, the study was to examine the association between coffee consumption and the risk of mortality in middle-aged Mediterranean folks. Study was conducted in the framework of uh, a project along with a prospective cohort study in more than 22,500 university graduates. The study started about the same time this show started, back in 1999. Uh, they ended up with uh, study. Yeah, they ended up with 19,896 participants, whose average enrollment was at 37.7 years of age. They completed uh, a bunch of semi-quantitative food frequency questionnaires to collect information on coffee consumption at the origin of the study, lifestyle, socio-demographic characteristics. Anthropo anthropometric measurements, 
not even sure what an anthropometric measurement is, but they did them as well as uh, accounted for previous health conditions. So uh, during the 10 year st study, 337 of the participants died, sadly. Well, some of them, maybe not sad. Uh, the researchers found that participants who consumed at least four cups of coffee per day, I'm in that category usually, had a 64% lower risk of all-cause mortality than those who never or almost never consumed coffee. Hmm. There was a 22% lower risk of all-cause mortality for each two additional cups of coffee per day. <laughs> That's fantastic. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Coffee equals good. And those who are at least 45 years old, drinking two additional cups of coffee per day was associated with a 30% lower risk of mortality. And this is all cause mortality. This is every disease. This is hit by a bus. This is whatever it is. It's all types of mortality. So car accidents, you have to assume, right? If that's one of them, you could apply it to everything, which is kind of illogical, right? You could say that it, would, it gives you a 64% a lower chance of dying in a car accident, 64% chance of dying from cancer, 64%. That's not true, right? You could be surviving car accidents better at 80%. It's because it's all cause. It's not drilled down to as of yet on this. But I, uh, but if you've, you're ever concerned that one more cup of coffee might, might make you a little over caffeinated or... <laughs> or make that night sleep uh, a little worse, but you want to have it because you want that little bit of edge go to get through it. the rest of the day, go Just for go it. Go for it. <laughs> Side effects will be, you're going to be much, much more Side likely to survive the day. You will survive the day. And at the end of any day, all we want to do really is have survived it. Actually, I'd like to have a good night's sleep at the end of any day. I mean, I do want to have survived my day, but... Hey, yeah. you know what? Good night's like sleep versus all-cause mortality risk. What are you going to choose, which, I'm confused about this because if you don't have good night's sleep, we know that your reaction times are like if you're drunk and you have a higher unless chance you have of more coffee. a car accident. Unless you drink more coffee. That's where you have to start your day with coffee. And then in the middle, <laughs> middle a little bit between, around brunch, you got to have more coffee. And then you start to fall off. You get sleepy right now, so you have some more coffee. And then the day's almost over, but you're really getting lethargic, so drink. Drink more coffee. Okay, I'm going to have to get on this oh. habit again. I drink my morning coffee. Two cups. Two large oh. cups. Maybe it's like eight cups if you were measuring. I don't know. We, we should measure. What is the measuring? Eight ounces? I think I'm in trouble. <laughs> well, I'm not in trouble. I'm great. No, you're doing fine if you're doing that. I'm great. Yeah, no, I'm doing great. just fine. Everything's okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. Speaking of keeping healthy. Oh my goodness. Yeah, because I thought we were. I thought I didn't go. I didn't scroll down on our. You like our show notes with a rundown. Kiki's got a ton more science. What you got, Kiki? I do. I've got stuff to keep us healthy. Well, that might keep us healthy. Healthy someday. Mm -hmm. Maybe not right away, but someday. Uh, researchers have reported from Purdue University on a way to deliver a drug into stored white fat cells so that they can turn into brown fat cells, which like to use energy and burn up. And oh, yeah, yeah, that's always a, yeah. And so there's this idea that maybe at one point in our past, we might've had more brown fat in our body and our physiological makeup, but that, um, that fat for, storage yeah. if because of extreme, extreme environments and lean times and cold temperatures maybe led our bodies to adapt more white fat storage for that, that and the, and energy. Yeah, right? that and the fact that we don't run everywhere to get everywhere and well, have it for a really long time. That's how we've changed. Where yes. maybe once upon a time we were much more no, mobile and yes. so this white fat storage was physiologically appropriate. And yeah. the problem is we have culturally changed and our civilizations are more likely to be sitting down in front of a computer screen or in the seat of a car or on a bus than they are to be walking across the plains in the, the hunt for, I don't know, ancient elk. You know, we're not doing that anymore. 
So the researchers uh, reported in the journal Molecular Therapy, they engineered a polymeric nanoparticle. It is an FDA-approved polymer that's known, it's known as PLGA. It's great, works in the body, non-reactive, very healthy, um, just doesn't react with the body. And they could attach a drug to this nanoparticle that's called dibenzaz... I always messed it. I thought I could do it. Dibenzazepine. <laughs> there we go. Dibenzazepine. You got to say it with a... There we Dibenzazepine. go. <laughs> Dibenzazepine. <sighs> and so this drug disrupts what's called notch sim signaling. It inhibits this signaling that takes place during cell division and... Uh, and what it does is it changes the fate of the white fat cells and leads them to become brown fat cells. And they injected the, these nanoparticles into mice and were able to reduce the amount of white fat, increase the amount of brown fat, change the metabolic parameters of the mice to more healthy than, uh, than the white fat. So, uh, Lots of white fat is an indicator for contribute contributions to type 2 diabetes, metabolic disease. And so the idea is that if they can get this to market, they have created a startup called Adipo Therapeutics, LLC. It's going to test and hopefully commercialize the technology that if they can bring it to market, they could inject the drug into fat deposits change the white fat on your body to brown fat that would then be easily burnable. You'd use your energy and your, your, your physiological indicators would be better. But that's the idea. That's the idea. Change the white fat to brown fat and it'll just burn right up and make you healthier in the progress, the process. Um, other researchers in another study doing something totally different reported in they reported their research in Nature on the transplantation of induced pluripotent stem cells into the brains of monkeys. These stem cells were taken from Parkinson's disease sufferers and control patients. They, it was skin or blood cells that were, uh, were collected and then induced to become dopaminergic neurons or the pluripotent stem cells that would go on to become dopaminergic neurons. The monkeys, male synomologous monkeys, Macaca fascicularis, had been treated with a neurotoxin, MPTP, and this neurotoxin kills dopamine-producing neurons. And so these monkeys had Parkinson's disease-like movement deficits, these symptoms, and the transplants improved the symptoms by 40 to 50 percent for at least a year compared to Whoa. just regular controls that didn't have any neurons injected. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, and it didn't matter whether the induced pluripotent stem cells came from Parkinson's disease patients or whether they came from controls. And this, I think, is a very interesting uh, point here. And the researchers uh, think that even if the cells carried genetic risk factors for the disease, it's the environmental insults that occur within the brain that are likely required to make the cells show a sign of pathology. So the question is now, you know, if you have people who have Parkinson's disease and you're able to get cells from a donor to be able to transplant them into the into a human brain, um, what could you take skin or blood cells from the Parkinson's patient themselves to be induced into neuronal stem cells? Or, you know, could they come from a, from a normal source? Would it matter? And that is the question. So anyway, the next clinical trials they're going to be doing, they're going to be addressing um, safety and the conditions that are necessary to make sure that they can get the methodology right. And so they're going to be doing some more rat and mice studies before they really get back into uh, looking at human stuff. So pretty fun stuff. Awesome stuff. But gosh, whenever, whenever we're on the cusp of cures, 
don't you just want like a massive infusion of funding to ramp up and yeah. get multiple trials done? <laughs> I mean, not quickly as, as they need to be done, but parallel. You know, um, whatever studies they've got planned, I would love for them to get funded to do four more studies in parallel Yeah. to knock out the next phase or two yeah. trials that they need to go to. Yeah, it's uh. the, the size of trials, the uh, infrastructure that's required, the, the dealing with patients or if it's human trials or dealing with uh, monkeys, if it's, you know, if, if you're at that stage, yeah. these things are expensive. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, funding, more funding so that we can move forward on actually solving these problems. Um, and then a study similar to yours that you were talking about with the, uh, the commensal bacteria and, uh, and E. coli that was, your study was published in, that you were talking about earlier was published in Nature. This is a study that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And they looked similarly at con commensal bacteria and have discovered that they release this team who, who published this paper uh, out of the lab of Dan Kalman at Emory University School of Medicine. They've determined that this is over 17 years of experiments that molecules, the really small molecules called indoles, get secreted by these commensal bacteria that can induce protection against the host, against stressors in the host. And so they tested this in C. elegans. They used E. coli that can colonize the gut uh, and found these indoles. And then, they, uh, and then they basically took the indoles and got rid of the E. coli themselves and put the indoles in the C. elegans. And the C. elegans seemed younger and healthier. Hmm. Which, which you have to have a very trained eye when a worm seems healthier, happier and healthier. Yeah, they were. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, they they also looked at Drosophila melanogaster, which harbors an indole producing E. coli. They found that these uh, Drosophila, which are fruit flies, performed better in climbing assays and survived heat stress better than flies that didn't have E. coli. And mice that had E. coli that produce indoles as well were more resistant to radiation than control mice. And these mice with these indole producing E. coli had uh, were more youthful, stronger, shinier coats, happier, spent more time at the gym. Yeah, um, so these indoles may have something to do with like the ligands you were discussing earlier, the way that these commensal bacteria communicate with their hosts, how they help them and can benefit them. And then uh, in the human body, well, they found that in, uh, in C. elegans and Drosophila, they found the indole actually works by attaching binding to an aryl hydrocarbon receptor the AHR, and the AHR actually recognizes a whole bunch of molecules, not just these indoles. And so um, the human body has a variant of it, and indoles absorbed from plant dietary sources or produced by these commensal bacteria uh, can be found in small quantities all over the body. So there might be something going on in the human body as well. We don't know that yet. The bacteria affecting our health. Um, and finally, the well, I have one more human health related study. The FDA has finally approved the first gene therapy uh, to occur in the United States. We've talked about it previously the CAR T therapy uh, using a patient's own cells. Immune, um, patients own T cells taken from the blood and genetically programmed so that they seek out antigens on, this, on the surface of leukemia cells. It's been approved. But, Woo ah, but, but, but ah. only going, only been approved for patients 25 years old and younger who have B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia and for whom they've had a uh, relapse at least twice and the cancer being still detectable after other treatments. Yeah, so and it, and this is a so last far, ditch. 
This is a last right. ditch treatment. Right. And it, and it's so far, even for the, not the acute, but the chronic uh, form, which is much less invasive and has a lot longer time span uh, of, of health available to it. They're, they're being very cautious and you, in the same sort of rigmarole, you have to have failed to have other therapies be effective and have to progress a long way. And this yeah. is, this is going to be, this is a kind of a typical thing that you're going to see across. Like we were, uh, somebody in the chat room was saying, you, you, you rarely hear about these things going beyond the initial, uh, the lower testing. This is, this is examples of higher testing levels, but they're not universal yet. You start human trials when it's the last arrow in the quiver time. Mm -hmm. um, and, yep. and, and, and it's sometimes a little bit unfair. Work out. Yeah, sometimes it's unfair because it, it, it was the last quiver. Maybe, maybe it would be more effective sooner. But you have to start here when the cost to risk uh, ratio is such that you're not jeopardizing the, a, a health of a patient Absolutely. by doing the treatment um, uh, severely enough, right? Absolutely. So, so, but fantastic that they have opened this up. There are people who didn't have an, an arrow left Yep. in the quiver. How come I'm talking about archery this whole night? <laughs> have you noticed this is like the third archery <sighs> thing? I've, <laughs> it's... <laughs> Bullseye. For whatever reason, my metaphors are all about archery tonight. Um, but these are folks that didn't have a, another bullet in the chamber. Why is it always violet? Isn't there another? <laughs> I don't have anything. These are folks say. that had no more. They had no Obi-Wan. They had no Obi-Wan upon whom to rely. That's right. Uh, more last minute, <laughs> <laughs> last minute messaging before uh, facing uh, the the... The death, the literal Death Star. Death Star. And oh therefore, no! <laughs> well, you started. It's actually working pretty good. Um, and this for, therefore, this is, this is, uh, this is going to be. Yes, I'll stop metaphoring. But yeah, so it's awesome for those folks that didn't have anything left to to try, yeah. and and the early, the early indications of a lot of CAR T is that this is going to be the path that these have had successful. And yep. Some human successful trials in the chronic and some in the lab that looked so fantastic. Uh, yeah, where yeah, this is how we get it into the human level. Yeah, the uh, result in one clinical trial for this particular CAR T therapy, this Kimria, mm -hmm. it left 83% of these particular uh, cancer le leukemia type patients cancer free three months on. So, Cured in three pretty, months, just yeah. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much cured, which is amazing. However, it's not cheap, $475,000. Yeah. Hopefully insurance will cover that. Yeah, uh, but you know what we don't really have insurance for? Uh huh? When, when fish farms break and fish from the fish farms, they flood into areas where they shouldn't be. Fish farming, we talk about it all the time. It's like, you know, fish farming, it can be this amazing thing to great, aqu terrible, aquaculture awesome, can allow. Awful. It, it could be great. It could feed. It could take care of our fish problems. If we figured out how to do it right, aquaculture could be the way that we can not destroy all the fish stocks. We can continue to feed humanity off the fish of the, the, the fruits of the sea. Um, but... Sometimes we don't do it exactly right. Like for instance, in Washington state, there's been a company for years, over a decade really, who has been, this company Cooks Aquaculture, has been set up in the Washington state area and they've been uh, breeding and raising Atlantic salmon in the Pacific Ocean. So they're like, it's fine. We keep the Atlantic salmon in the nets. Everything's great. They don't mix with the Pacific salmon. Everything's fine. Anyway, this is controversial. There was a uh, there was an anti farming protest that's set for next month, and uh, people have been debating this forever. But just this last week, they had an incident, and I love this headline. I love this headline. Fish Farm blamed the, quote, exceptionally high tides resulting from the solar eclipse for their net failures. Hmm. 
And you know what happened? 300,000 Atlantic salmon spilled into the Pacific Ocean. And now the only thing that we can do is tell the fishermen to start fishing. Just go out there, fishermen. You are the Pacific salmon's only hope. Oh, my goodness. Because if the Why Atlantic am I not salmon... in Washington and don't have a boat? <laughs> Right. The the be- news now is yeah. go out and fish for as many Atlantic salmon as you can get. <laughs> the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife basically has said, you know, they're in the, in they're in the ecosystem at this point. They're competing now with natural populations. Um, we don't know that they can breed the Atlantic salmon with Pacific salmon, but we don't want that to happen. And we want to maintain the Pacific salmon population size and the coho salmon population sizes. So get thee to Seattle. Go yeah. fishing. Fish on. <laughs> Fish, on. Fish on. Yeah, there's some, if, if the, the math works out of there are 305,000 10 pound Atlantic salmon that were released. That means there's over 3 million pounds of fish to be caught. Oh, yeah. Dinner for days. <laughs> Dinner for days. So that's really an them. awful, horrible thing, uh, potentially. Potentially, yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, fishermen why, of the Looney Nation it, have... Why does it have to be Atlantic? Like, why couldn't they, couldn't they be doing the fish farm with Pacific salmon in the Pacific Ocean? Like, it seems like that was an unnecessary step. And I don't understand why, but maybe they... Maybe it's because you can't get Atlantic salmon. Right? Making so, it fresh it's, Atlantic it's salmon sustainable. closer. Mm-hmm. And you make it closer exactly. and you're making it sustainable, but it's the fish that different that you couldn't just use the local population. And then just if it got out, oh, well, you know, do bad. Move along. <laughs> Move uh. along. Yeah. Mm. So fishermen are out there. Fishermen of the Lumi Nation have already headed out and netted over 200,000 pounds of the fish over this past weekend. But oh, wow. um, the fish have probably already spread over a 60 mile area and are moving past that probably even now. And as Eric in Alaska says in the chat room, there are worries that they will also reach Alaskan waters. Yeah. So- and, and, and the other thing, I guess that what we don't I, want them to do. I guess that might be to the benefit of 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 sort of solving this issue is I I have an, an instinct as a somebody who fished a couple times that the that the 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 fishery fish might be more likely to take a lure. Uh, I, I you I know, don't know about that. I don't know about that at all. It might not be true, but if that's true, that might increase the chances of those getting fished first, which which you then wouldn't want to spread that behavior to spread to the other population. No, you don't want that at all. Mm-mm. No, but you know what I want to do right now? Uh-oh. I want to say thank you to everyone for watching. Yes. That's what I want to do. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to everyone for watching out there thanks to everyone for listening out there you're our audience we love you so much and i want to say also thank you to our patreon sponsors drum roll please but let's see if i can do it today Thank you to Paul, Disney, G. Burton, Lattimore, John, Ratnaswamy, Richard Onimus, Byron Lee, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Jacqueline Boyster, Tyrone Fong, Andrew Grove, Keith Corsell, Jake Jones, Gerald Sorrells, Chris Clark, Richard Hendricks, Charlene Henry, Brian Hedrick, John Grady Lee, Steve Bickle, Kevin Railsback, Ulysses Adkins, Dave Old Friedel, James Randall, Bob Cardle, Mark Brissar- Calder, Mark Brissaro, Edward Dyer, Train 84, Layla Marshall Clark, Larry Garcia, Randy Mazuka, Tony Steele, Gerald Ron- Onyago, Steve DeBell, Louis Smith, The Harden Family, IFSHMN, Greg Guthman, Patrick Cohn, Kissinia Volkova, Volkova, Daryl Harun Sarang, Alex Wilson, Jason Schneiderman, Dave Neighbor, Jason Dozier, Matthew Litwin, Eric Knapp, Jason Roberts, Richard Porter, Rodney, David Wiley, Robert Aston, Sir Frankadelic, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Paul Stanton, David, Brendan Mish, Gail Bryant, Tora Northcutt, Arlene Moss, <laughs> Bill Kersey, Ben Rothig, Darwin Hannon, Rudy Garcia, Felix Alvarez, 
Brian Hone, Orly Radio, Brian Condren, Mark, Nathan Greco, Hexator, Mitch Neves, Flying Out, John Crocker, Christopher Dreyer, R.T. Amshu, Wada, Dave Wilkinson, Steve Mashinsky, Rick Ramis, Gary Swinsberg, Phil Nadeau, Braxton Howard, Sal, Sal Good Sam, Matt Sutter, Emma Grenier, Philip Shane, James Dobson, Kurt Larson, Stephen Insama, Honey Moss, Martin Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Jason Olds, James Paul West, Alec Doty, Alumalama, Joe Wheeler, Dougal Campbell, Craig Porter, Adam Mishkan, Aaron Luth, and Marjorie, David Simmerly, Tyler Harrison, and Columbo Ahmed. made it through. Thank you for supporting us on Patreon. All your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, you can find out more at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash This Week in Science. Also, remember that you can find out more about This Week in Science at twist.org. We have all sorts of things there. On next week's show, we'll be broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time on twist.org slash live. There's a link there that you click that says watch live, and you can go click on that Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time. You watch and join our chat room because there's so many great people in the chat room. Love all those chat room chatting chats. <laughs> Anyway, if you can't make it live, don't worry. You can find all of our past episodes at twist.org slash YouTube at facebook.com slash This Week in Science or twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have a mobile type device, you can simply look for Twist, the number four droid app in the Android Marketplace or simply This Week in Science and anything Apple marketplace -y. For more information oh, on yeah, anything you've heard that. today. Oh. <laughs> For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website, twist.org. You can also make comments there. It's true. And you can start conversations with the hosts and other listeners in those comments. Yes, you or you that. can just contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in that subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at TwistScience, at Dr. Kiki, at JacksonFly. And at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover, or address a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. And we'll be back here next week. And we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you have learned anything from the show, remember it's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, science, science. I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the eye Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science 
it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought. And I'll try to answer any question you've got. So how can I ever see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way. You better just listen to what we say. And if you learn anything from the words that we said, then please just remember it's all in your head. Because it's this week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, science, science. This week in science, this week in 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 science. Missed Blair's Animal Corner. I did, but that's why I brought the moth story. I thought the moth invertebrate sex story would be one that would be appropriate and appreciated by uh, by Blair if she had been here, right? Yes, yes. <sighs> yeah, fada. I'm going backwards a ways. Right, the fish farm owner claiming the solar eclipse tides. Yeah, they messed up. They messed up. They should have known. The tides change. They go up and they go down. And yes, when they're when you have the moon close and things light up gravitationally, there's a little bit more of the pull on the tides and you have a larger tide and it happens. It does happen. You know, sometimes you have a tide and sometimes you have a larger tide. It's where the moon is in the cycle. It's just the way it goes. And so... You manage your freaking fish farm, dude. You don't have an accident like that. Don't blame it on the eclipse. Hmm. -mm. Foolish. Foolish. Um, Ed from Connecticut. Yeah, the uh, Chetco Bar Fire is very far from, uh, far away from Portland. It's massive. It's on the uh, Oregon California border, so it's about stayed away, but we have been uh, very, very affected by the smoke here for the last week. Um, I know there's more smoke further south, but we've been, we've also got, a we've had a lot of it, which I found very interesting seeing as we're so far north. Oh, the air quality is not, not so good, but I do hope that uh, the fire is taken care of. I hear the Chetco Bar Fire is the biggest, if not one of the biggest in the United States at this point in time. Did I read that correctly? Did I? Did I read it correctly? Oh, somebody is not being nice in the YouTube comments again. Who's over in YouTube? Who is in YouTube hanging out? You guys, you being nice. Is everybody being nice? Playing nice, talking science over in the YouTube comments. Hey, YouTube, how you doing? I hope everything's good over there in the YouTubes. Mm. 
Yeah, apparently something happened. TVG Live is out of there. Everybody's out of there. There's nobody in the YouTubes anymore. How do, where do, oh, there's my three. There's my three dots. Who's in there? Oh, Croft. He has been deleted. Has been deleted. Hello. Nobody's in chat anymore. Nobody's in that chat anymore. Cause the science is done. Hmm. Wait. Is, uh, do we have a ploy to increase viewership? Hmm. What? A ploy? Yeah, identity four. Oh, the YouTubes. Oh, I love this chat room, you guys. You guys are the best. Always entertaining. Yeah, what's it? Do not miss the after show with the cats. I'll bring in the cats. Eric in Alaska. Yeah, exactly. Catch of the day. It's going to be Alaskan salmon. I mean, not Alaskan. It's going to be Atlantic salmon. Atlantic salmon. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, right. Catch of the day everywhere for a little while. Oh, my goodness. So yes. I saw... What? Go ahead. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, drinking more coffee keeps all the East Coast awake longer. Thank you, Whiskey Renegade. Good advice for all those East Coast listeners. Just drink coffee late into the evening. Just drink the it's coffee. Fine. Yeah, totally fine. It's fine. Oh. Fada said there was banning that had to happen because there was harassment in the YouTubes. Yeah, well, that's what the that's were in the tubes. That's unfortunate. Thank you for managing that, Fada. Um. Yeah, I'm glad we have I'm glad we have a nice chat over here. Um yeah, identity four, you're awesome. <laughs> um yeah, in the beginning of August there were other fires that were going on. There were yeah, more local fires. There was a fire at Mount Jefferson and there was a fire near Mount Hood. Um yeah, there were lots of more local fires and so the air quality was terrible and they were telling, and, and it was like a hundred degrees. So they were just telling everybody to stay indoors. I did not know it was worse at that particular time than Shanghai, Beijing, and New Delhi. Oh my goodness. Jeez. New Delhi. Yeah. Oh, Everyone, yeah. everyone who uh, I know that went up there reported uh, crystal clear skies for it. So yeah, well for the eclipse, Everything cleared up. It was beautiful. Yeah. And then like the day the day after the eclipse, the sky was more overcast. We had high clouds and then the then the smoke came back. It was serendipitous. The clearing it was fantastic. Panoramic, I'm so glad you've been able to watch us, not have to have breakfast with us, I guess, but you're staying up a little bit later with us in the evenings. <laughs> She's in, uh, she's in, uh, maybe Nevada right now. Yeah. So she was, over, she was on the coast recently, right? She's been all over the place. She went to the coast. You got she's to been... meet, I'm jealous. You got to meet Pam. So do tell. How in was person, your visit? Twice. In yeah. person. What'd oh, you do? Was, how was your visit? The whole time. <laughs> well, she is a three-year-old and her and my four-year-old, uh, her, her three-year-old, my four-year-old hung out. Awesome. Around. For a largely part of the time, we we hung out like like doting parents. Um, when you try to hang out, but really you just take care of the kids. You just yeah, you're just helicoptering. Um, but yeah, the kids hung out and got along great. They had a blast, so it was totally successful. That's awesome. The kids hung out. We, That's uh, good. At least we know that the uh, the next generation gets along. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> there will be somebody. There will be somebody left to uh, pick up the mantle of what was your what was the words meaningless Pod, words meaningless Pod, words which, we, yeah. which is almost we we used to do this show that that tackled political issues but it it's become to the point where it's too ridiculous it's like <laughs> the oh, the uh yeah, you can't even at this point the fake newsness of everything that show is yeah, it's it's the show is just the show now. It's there's nothing 
we need to add to it. Yes. <laughs> no, you're like Did just you... implied. And you're like, and here's the news. This is exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> what? It's just it, folks. <laughs> I don't know just anymore. It. Ah, you drank Foster's. Oh, that's funny, Pam. Yeah. You were in... Which, it turns out we did a little bit of research required. Foster's. It's, uh, the, you know, Australian for beer, which is actually brewed in Texas and doesn't exist anywhere. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, I know. I got to meet some other Australians. Maybe Pam knows them. <laughs> yeah, because all Aust- It's I'm such a small kidding. country. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You know, although, although the way um, the way that this visit came about was a chance meeting at the last eclipse. Um, yeah, because of Pamela and Doug. Uh, Doug's radio parallax. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Doug, I didn't realize Doug was an eclipse chaser. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm, then I found out because Pam was like, "Look at this! I got a picture of the two of us, and he's from Davis and KWS and." What? Yeah, that was pretty awesome. Yeah. I love that. So maybe it's a smaller world than I think it is. It is. Sometimes I'm like, it's so big. And then other times I go, oh, it's so small. (laughs) Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah. It's the collapsing factor of human relationships. It is it is a big world. It is a very large world, but like when we uh, have human relationships that make it small. Mm-hmm. to Baltimore and we went to some random small gathering of humans small like 30 humans or less oh yeah that uh, Patrick put together yeah or, or invited us to invited us to oh yes 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 the music venue the music and venue the different one in the yeah. music venue was one of the voiceover actors from Jack Feedback no I thought that was so great yeah this is just like how Crazy small world is this? Who I, who I had no idea was even in the area. I knew he was on the East Coast, but it was in a different city and happened to be there. And, and while my mind was being just perpetually blown by this, um, Walt had a good, uh, Walt Williamson had a good uh, explanation. He's like, well, people gravitate to other people. And when you gravitate towards certain types of other people, you're more likely to run into your particular flavor of human again and again. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think that's a big part of it. You know, I think the, the, that's what I feel like one of the biggest benefits of us doing this show is all the wonderful people that we've met who, who share interests and are of that flavor yeah. Uh, that, that we we gravitate towards this whole technology of internet and podcasting um, has has allowed us to connect to a lot of those people who mm-hmm. would be our friends if we were you know in closer proximity, but scattered about the earth as we are, it takes it it takes something like this to to be able to to run into one another. So yeah. Yeah. Um, strengths, there are no videos of me watching the eclipse. I did a very short um, periscope oh, yeah. right anyway, before. I, I, love the, I love the picture of, of you and Blair. <laughs> I'll find that picture. Uh, supposedly yeah. looking up at the, the, the totality uh-huh. with these long shadows <laughs> cast behind you uh-huh. in, in, in total daylight. <laughs> like, that, was, that was hilarious. We have to do a recreation photo. No, it wasn't totality. Yep. Here, I'll show you. It, this was not totality <laughs> because we're wearing our glasses. Okay. If, you're, if you're wearing the glasses, it's not totality. This was uh, probably about... My guess is it was after. It was after, yeah, because Blair and yeah. I actually <laughs> were separated. She was with her friends, and I was with my friends, and then the, the eclipse happened, the totality happened, and about five minutes later, she called me, and she was like, where are you? And I, I, I explained where I was, and she came and found me, and then we spent some time together, ooing and aahing and doing photos. Okay. Yes, and so let's see. Who do I, I have photos of? There's our not pointing photo. 
And then there's children with mermaids. Oh, yes. Children with mermaids and photos. Yeah, it was fun. We had a good time. Have I stopped screen sharing? Yes. 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 I had a, we had a good group of people. We did a, oh, and here's one of my favorite photos. We took um, a colander. And so oh, nice. that's the, well, that's that's the eclipse through the colander. And all of those little things, each of those, each of them. That's the sun. Oh, that's eclipse. That's eclipse. That's eclipse. That's eclipse. That's eclipse. That's eclipse. All the eclipses. Nice. Yeah. It was fun to do. Hey, child, hold up a colander. Look what happens. It could be a design for a back of a sweatshirt. And this is what my phone did for total eclipse. That's all you get. <laughs> no. That's it. Yeah, the eclipse was pretty awesome. Want to see my family eclipse photo? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Where's my... This is, I swear, it's, it's like, it should be in black and white and like a 1960s 50s kind of thing. I love everybody wearing the glasses. No. And the mermaid. <laughs> and the mermaid. Because Shelly had to come along. <laughs> yeah, one day you're going to have to talk, talk to Marshall about his affinity for this inflatable mermaid. I know, Marshall. What's up with the, what's up with the mermaid? Here's my, here's my son. And the mermaid pre eclipse. Pre eclipse. There we go. Hanging out. Hanging out. Hey, Pam's getting some art of yours. Um, yeah. What? How'd that yeah. happen? I want art from Jackson Fly. All right. Well, Did you have your show? No, no, it's not yet. It's, ah, you know what? It might be happening in like or two. When? Um, I don't know. Uh, first Friday, second Friday. It's the second Friday of September. Okay, so next Friday. <clears throat> so uh, is that next Friday? That's next Friday. Jeez. Mm -hmm. Not the one coming, but the one after. Okay. Yeah. Um. If not, it'll be happening the uh, month after that. But I think that's when it's all scheduled to go. I haven't got final, final confirmation. Um, but uh, I'm all ready to go hang painting, so we'll see. Yeah. Oh, Whiskey Renegade, right. He's talking about how we, we were talking about the connectiveness of what we're doing. And Whiskey, Whiskey says, this is a bad thing, right? Aren't we supposed to be forcing ourselves to interact with people of different lifestyles? Good point. Well, you are, whether you know it or not. Get out of the you house, are, everybody. You are, you are interacting with people of different lifestyles. Yeah, but maybe there's uh, some similarities, it's just that some differences. Not per, in fact, you're not precluding people with different lifestyles by interacting based on a love of science. Yes. You're, pre, you're, yeah. you're not precluding for, for any of those regular preclusion factors, but people whose whose interests are similar to yours. Yeah, like you're not precluding me for the love of my cute kitty cats. Look at my cute kitty cats. Ah! They're sleeping there with the kitty cat pillow. There's like... It's kind of cat themed in that photo. It is very cat themed. Yeah. And they're sleeping and making a little kitty heart. They're making a little kitty. One side of the heart, the other side of the heart, the kitty heart. <laughs> Did I see Bonnie Tyler singing Total Eclipse of the Heart on a cruise ship during the eclipse? No, I didn't. <laughs> Refusing. That's funny. You don't have to watch that. But what I do recommend here, I'll, I'll get the, 
uh, what is it? It's um, add lip reading. Total eclipse of the heart. I have probably shared this before. Oh, mm -hmm. literal. This is seriously, man, YouTube, why'd you go and mess with your interface? So annoying. I'm just going to share it in the chat room. So there's a um, somebody who did music videos, the literal version. So the music videos, like the song was resung based on what's happening in the music videos as opposed to the lyrics of the song. So it's, it's very funny. It's pretty funny. One of my favorites. <laughs> Ed, 2024, go to Mazatlan for the eclipse. There you go. <laughs> I've seen the little uh, interpretation video before. This one does crack me up. It makes me laugh every time. Oh, she can't so dramatically posing. <laughs> Bottle shot. Uh, makes me laugh every time. Oh, Identity 4 got a picture with a fancy camera. Ooh, nice. Um, it's a sliver of the eclipse, the crescent sun. Oh, my gosh. As opposed to the crescent moon. I like it. Uh, also, our That's friends in the, the Baltimore, Maryland area were posting all sorts of sad posts about the overcastness. When the uh, when the eclipse came by, when was that? Oh, in San Francisco? No, no, no. Uh, uh, East Coast, Baltimore, East Maryland, Coast. folks. Oh yeah, yeah. They had they had fog. San Francisco the had fog. fog. Um, the uh, oh, what was the name of Lincoln? If you're in City. San Francisco, you should expect that there's going to be. You should have left because you should expect that there's going to be fog. I mean, it's dang near a given. Yeah, Lincoln City, where the uh, eclipse first hit the Oregon coastline, fogged out. Nobody could see it there. They had to drive up and away from the fog line to be able to actually see anything. Yeah, a lot of people stuck in the fog. You got to think about where you're going as opposed to, this would be a great place. No, no, it's going to be foggy. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Somebody's yelling outside. What's going on? Rob was just in Mazatlan. It's hot there. Yes, it is hot there. I don't know if it, uh, it'll be April, right? Mazatlan in April. That might be nice. Might not be too hot. <laughs> the longest the Pam has posted that we'll get a seven minute eclipse in 2186. I don't think anyone, any of us are going to see that. If any of us see that, that means that there have been some major advances in long longevity research. Faux show. Faux show. Um, let's see. Next week, Blair will be back. It will be September. I will have in the next week. Hopefully tomorrow I will post a, a pre-order link for calendars so that people can pre-order calendars. And I really liked Ed's question of whether or not a crayon will come with the calendar. That's funny. I like that. I could do that, actually. I might do that. That would be fun. Send you some crayons. Although I don't know if crayons will color on the paper very easily. Pens. Everybody gets one pen. You only get one colored pen to color in the calendar. Oh boy. 
Dum, da, dum, dum, dum. Um, is there anything else? Anything else we need to think about? It's so funny. It's like some stories really hit my hit my head and get my head head thinking about things. And that osteocalcin story of yours, I keep thinking about it. Well, it's 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 a drill down on a mechanism, right? It's yeah. it's that thing that we always hope a st uh, a story that's showing an effect without knowing why it's showing the effect. Um, yeah. But I, I but this, I was trying to remember. Yeah. I was like, okay, going back, you know, to the early two thousands when I was deep in my physiology coursework, and I'm like trying to. I was you know, I went back and I grabbed my endocrine physiology textbook and it doesn't even have osteocalcin in this in the uh yeah. in this in the back and in the biblio not bibliography in the reference in the appendix whatever um so it doesn't even have osteocalcin in that endocrine physiology book mm. and so like looking online really quickly it's osteocalcin was really just thought of as like this it, it was a protein in the bone and they were just looking at it like it, it just an indicator of bone turnover. Hmm. And so, and it's just, I think more recently that these other roles for it have become elucidated. And so this is totally kind of, this is a new way of looking at it, which is, I find, I find that fascinating. And there's, yeah, like you said, mechanism, but also there, it just opens up new questions as well. Hmm. Yeah, uh, and and this is this is uh, this is also one of the fascinating and frustrating things about doing the show at the same time. <laughs> it's, it'd be it'd be great to fifteen twenty years from now just be like, oh hey, did you hear? There's a pill you can take that keeps your cognitive decline from from happening. Oh, that's yeah. just awesome. But to hear about it now and then know that it's not ready, I know that. It, Oh, now I'm waiting. Before I wasn't standing in line. It's about this show is it's like going to the DMV on some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. You learn about it and then you got to wait. You have to wait yeah. for the actual but, payoff. Mm -hmm. But also exciting because you know what's coming around the corner. You know what the horizon, what's beyond that horizon. So yeah. And, 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 and that you can also inform your decisions about, you know, when, you, when you're thinking about, we're seeing stories about tax dollars being added to or cut from uh, the sciences. You know the importance of those dollars. You know the the benefits society can reap from them uh, if they're placed there. Whereas maybe not everybody does. Maybe some folks don't know or understand which dollars are actually doing for them. doing so much yeah the uh so much uh, i'm gonna not talk about this uh, but we've got the wrong epa right now yeah and we've got the wrong a lot of things we right got now. the wrong a lot of things but we definitely have the wrong epa because they're there's there's folks who influence the epa who are ahead of the epa saying it we're already saying mocking connections between global warming and events of severe flooding and you know the severe flooding is a tragedy uh on a, on a number of levels but one is ideological you know this is a this is it's it's we're we're seeing devastation in a community or even th simple things that, as a Californian, you take for granted because they're everywhere. Things like zoning laws, which mm -hmm. frustrate developers and homeowners right. sometimes. Yeah, uh, but the zoning laws weren't... and the regulations, if they had been put in place or even enforced in Houston, there would not yeah, be the they, same they amount. Huge, yeah. huge subdivisions built in the path of their, their, their flood release programs. Because yeah. there was not nobody just, to say, that's ah, a good idea. Yeah, not just that, though. There's, uh, I, I think it was in ProPublica, big article from like 2016, because this flooding is not a new issue. This happens, you know, on this scale, it's, you know, massive, but it's unprecedented. But um, this happens, the flooding happens over and over again because the development is happening 
and uh, it's they're taking over prairie grass land and the developers say it's just grassland it's nothing there but really um, the grassland even though you have a foot or two of grass above the ground the root systems go down over 15 feet below the surface and by going down so far below the surface they provide an absorbent area that can absorb massive amounts of water and when you put concrete on top of it uh, ends it that's done there's no yeah. absorbing it's just going to run into the rivers or the creeks and things are going to overflow and then you have flooding it's yeah it's it's amazing yeah identity for the epa head came out and said that science should not dictate policy exactly and while i there is some truth to that science should not be the dictator for policy because we do have to balance politics with you know the needs of the people and so there's always a balance between there, there's a balance between things but you don't do things i mean when when there is scientific evidence that certain actions will cause problems such as massive flooding you should really take those into account Dic science should not dictate policy science should inform policy yeah, and policy should not be put upon us by dictators. Look, yeah, yes, there you go. Look, uh, you know, when when we like, like at the head of the show, I, I said this wasn't a natural disaster; it's man-made. These things are predictable. The previous floods should have uh, allowed for plans to be put in place, and they were. Uh, under Obama, there was this whole thing about when you when you do new infrastructure building, you have to take into account. The, the future environment that this infrastructure is going to be living in, you have to factor in global warming. They shot this down, uh, so th which means that the federal funding for uh, infrastructure going forward in the Houston or you know Texas areas won't have to uh, incorporate things like what just happened. It's ridiculous, and and and. And this is this is man-made disaster in in that the the local zoning laws didn't deter, did, there are no zoning laws not the local zoning laws there aren't zoning laws in Houston meaning you can put a skyscraper next to a residential home next to a factory next to a whatever and if it's in the floodplain that also doesn't matter you know um, that's that's man-made. Uh, creating disaster. It's it's one of those harsh things that, like, I I always uh, have have well that I've in the past at least talked about Haiti. Haiti is a man made disaster. Haiti's going to have another gigantic earthquake if it's mm -hmm. rebuilt with no matter what dollars, without the the regulations and the zoning. Build, the it's building going regulations to, and zoning that, that something like same. San Francisco is based on. It's yep. going to come down again, yep. and maybe with a larger population than last time. So you have to you have to know what you're doing in this world, and and the idea that we can keep plowing forward, knowing the risks and ignoring them, and then chalking it up to well, that was just one bad storm. No, that's not how living in reality works. No, you learn from experience. You say, oh. There's this yeah, big uh, storm and it did all this flooding. What if a bigger storm came? Maybe we should consider what we're doing and how we build and what, how. Uh, 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 uh. What, and what's that whole saying? There's a whole saying that's like kind of popular or famous that uh, it's like, if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. Yeah. yeah. And if you ignore science going forward, which I can't believe anybody's doing still to this day. You know, these, these, these were predicted, the greater flooding. But has been the Justin, biggest prediction of devastation. But what and, has science ever done for me? Really? What has it been and, and, for me? And it, I hate putting it into these terms, but if you look at the economic impact of all of the terrorist attacks that have ever taken place upon this country, and you compare those with the economic downside of being completely unprepared and ignorant of, of these man-made natural disasters um they pale in comparison a hundred billion dollars they're talking about 
and and to rebuild it how you know yeah we need we need smarter people at the helm yeah especially the the area also some and another other articles that i've read uh suggest that it's not just going to be economically impacting uh the houston area or just Texas, because this region of the country uh, receives a large proportion of our petroleum imports um, and the petroleum manufacturing processing plants are, and, and also just the processing plants that are there taking in oil from the local uh, producers and processing them, they're offline. So petroleum is going to be affected in a major way, which will affect fuel, pli- fuel prices across right. the country. Um, it also is a big imports uh, imports port for food. It's an exports port for food. Um, there are things that we send to other countries and that we receive from other countries that we will not be doing. Just not By the way, Houston is receiving uh, massive amounts of humanitarian aid from Mexico right now. Just to yeah, even though, absolutely. even though, yeah, it wasn't really accepted. <laughs> you know, the uh, well, it has been now. It's the there federal now. Government. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and one of those, you know, one of those things to build a wall. Oh, and they've reduced, uh, regulations on transport of, of, um, petrol chemicals, uh, during this to try to make sure that they can, you know, you don't have to, I don't know what, have your truck checked twice or three times. And there's a little bit of irony that we're not speaking about, which is that a community or a region of the country that is sort of the hub of the fossil fuel industry which is likely financed uh, most of the lobbying against global warming is the one being the most impacted at the moment. Bit of irony there. Yep. Don't mess with Mother Nature. Don't mess with it, man. No way. Yeah. Mother Nature could just spit someday and we'd be gone. Whew. Right? Little sneeze. Achoo! Oops, that was the human cold. Got rid of that. So I get just Googled EPA news. I'm just going to read headlines. No, uh, no, for Scott no, Bruins- no, 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 no. <laughs> Wait, what? It's okay. You're just cover uh, your headphones. Uh, for Scott Pruitt's EPA, climate change denial is mission critical. That's from the nation. Trump's EPA claims scientists are politicizing Hurricane Daily Caller. EPA says climate scientists trying to politicize Texas Storm. It's Reuters. Uh, latest EPA waived some clean air rules due to Harvey. That's in depth. Atlantic, uh, that's the Atlanta Journal Constitution. EPA extends waiver on motor fuel contents to apply nationwide. To apply nationwide. I don't think it'll hit California. We'll still probably fight it. Uh, yeah. It's, we've got the wrong people in charge, which which and I don't care what party, uh, you you your preferences. Hopefully, you agree that the current situation could be a lot better. Oh man, I find yeah. it interesting <clears throat> that they decided to uh, waive the clean air rules. Mm-hmm. As a result, nationwide. nationwide, nationwide. As a result of Harvey, yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, it's like, oh yeah, it's like that's a big storm. We'll just you know give everyone a break for a minute. I mean, especially considering Exxon has trouble at its processing plant. It uh, could ex- it. They've said that it that it could blow up. They're releasing large amounts of sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide because of what's wrong. Ah, anyway, yeah, I have a hard time reading the news and the social medias. I go online for the science and for the friends, and then the bad things. I'm like, ah, they make me very depressed. But the positive things, the positive things. United Way has launched a National Hurricane Harvey Recovery Fund with starting with $1 million from Leo DiCaprio and the Leo DiCaprio Foundation. And um, Svaha, the science STEM clothing line, 
that we had um, Jaya Iyer on the show to talk about. Do you remember that interview, Justin? Wait, what was the interview? When we're talking Remy, about the, what was the, subject? the STEM fashion, the STEM clothes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was the beginning of this month. Yeah, they are donating some of the proceeds from, they're doing a fundraiser donating oh, awesome. from purchases to Hurricane Harvey Relief. So buy some STEM clothes from Svaha. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. <sighs> I think I need to go to bed. It's 10 30. Right. Good night, uh, minions. Good night, Kiki. But hang out for two seconds with me and then after the after show, Kiki. I got a quick question for you. All right. But good night, uh, everybody else. We'll see you again next week. Hope you managed to stay dry uh, during all of this and insanity. Of, and out of the smoke and alive. Yeah. We hope, yeah, we hope everyone has. Uh, and their families and friends are safe and healthy and able to join us for more science next week. Yeah. And if you're ever concerned that the, the region in which you live doesn't fit your flavor, come to California or, or Oregon. Or Oregon. We're this is where we're waiting for you. <laughs> where the fires are. We are waiting <laughs> for you. In the land something. of summer fires. There we go. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night.